Hi, welcome to Culturally Determined. I'm your host, R.A. Cohen Wade, and my guest today is Justin Murphy. Uh, Justin, could you please introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. My name is Justin. I was a professor for something like five years, almost six, and decided to quit academia and go full-time on the internet, just doing, trying to convert my intellectual life, my research, and my teaching into more entrepreneurial formats made for the internet. And I've been doing that for about a year and a half now. And yeah, it's been cool. <laughs> uh, well, thanks for coming on. And so uh, I first uh, learned about you through a podcast called uh, Chat for God, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit more. And then uh, a couple months ago, I guess I saw you were talking online to a woman who has been on the show before, uh, and she goes by the online pseudonym uh, Default Friend. And the the and she was actually on the show. It was one of the last episodes, I guess, I recorded before the uh, pandemic hit. And we we're talking about online dating and how she uh, had some discontent with uh, with that system and wrote an essay about it. And uh, so we'll link to that episode, which people can uh, check out as a little uh, dip into the you know the before times, as we say now. Um, and then uh, so you were talking about this idea about um, uh, starting an online matchmaking service and. Uh, and uh, and it has come about and, and, and it, so can you uh, talk about the um the genesis of this was it really it almost seemed like it the idea was hatched like on twitter and and, and it's and you know there's probably 10,000 ideas hashed every day on twitter but 99,900 um nothing ever happens but this one seems like something has happened so can you uh, can you talk about this uh this project yeah, sure. So I've been married for seven years now, and I'm a millennial. I'm uh, 34, and to be to be 34 years old today and be married for seven years is actually it's it's, it's like I got married young, although it wasn't young at all. You right. know, historically, I got married when I was about 27, if I recall. And for me, it's been a really fascinating, just almost, uh, almost surreally. Uh, transformative experience like it's 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 fundamentally more uh, impressive and and powerful and experience to be married than I think most people realize that they're not married and so I just wrote a Twitter thread a few weeks ago about this and trying to express why I think marriage is a uniquely beautiful thing and of course we know a lot of the research on how it has very positive effects on people's lives in many dimensions so we know that it's really good I believe deeply and personally that uh, it's it's even better than people realize in a kind of phenomenological way. And I think it's a shame. It's a real shame that uh, millennials and, and Zoomers wait so long to get married. I think I think way too long. And I have a personal hunch or feeling that a lot of people's lives could be made much better if they were to get married earlier. And I see it as a kind of coordination problem. Uh, I see it as a kind of basic old fashioned game theoretic problem where, uh, you know, you have many potential pairings in the world of people who would be quite happy as married spouses and their individual welfare would be significantly increased if they just got married and stayed together for the rest of their life. But they're not doing it for weird cultural problems that which we could get into if you want to. And I think that when you have a coordination problem, you just need some kind of third party mechanism that uh, acts as a forcing function to basically force those potential pairs to get married. And that's traditionally what arranged marriages have always done. So my idea was, well, I wrote this Twitter thread basically about marriage and it got a lot of traction. So I was like, huh, you know, people, this seems to resonate. We should just create a little agency that basically forces people to marry each other. <laughs> and we do a lot of good for the world. And I have a lot of wacky, interesting, creative internet friends. And, uh, you know, default was one who came out of the woodwork and was like, yeah, let's do that. <laughs> uh so okay so this this currently exists in in, uh, in some form so people people have applied and what's the, what's it called we're just calling it arranged marriages like the arranged marriages company so it's uh, arranged marriages.co okay uh so people can can check that out if they're interested and they and so people so you've got applications and it, it's currently in process okay so there's lots of interesting here um and you know as i was um uh, I, I couldn't remember what the what the site was called, and so I googled your name and arranged marriage, and um, and there were four uh, Google ads for or maybe I did matchmaking, uh, Justin Murphy matchmaking, and there were four Google ads, which is a, which is a lot. Usually you get one at, one or two at most, and so I guess this is something I hadn't thought about, but it is sort of a thriving marketplace <laughs> in some extent because there's people who want to get married, and yeah, you I mean you were making the case for marriage, but um, I think probably for most people, even you know post uh 
sex revolution and dating apps and everything else. There's still like, it's very strong American narrative about getting married and, and that being like the ultimate goal and like sort of the last life achievement before having kids and, um, and and so forth. So I guess, yeah, there's, there's, there's lots of people out there trying to do this in some sort of way to uh, make money. But so what is, um, what is your, uh, (laughs) what, what, what is the term used in Silicon Valley? Like your, uh, secret sauce or something. What is, what do you, how are you different than all these other ones that are, we're uh, showing yeah. the ads on Google. Totally. I think our unique our unique selling point is pretty clear. It's that you know most matchmaking services out there suggest who you might want to date or marry, but we are going to force people to marry. That's the unique thing, right? That's uh, what no other agency is willing to do, and that's going to be <laughs> our angle. Okay, so talk about so talk more about that. And I believe what it, when you were originally talking about this, you were, part of it was. Um, men from the hinterlands and women from the metropole was was part of the idea. Is this still part of it or not? That's a hypothesis. So there are many different hypotheses as to how this could actually work and why it would actually take off. But we have an open mind about what types of partnerships are going to be the ones that are most successful. We're going to take a very open-minded kind of data-driven attitude towards it all. Um, One of my hypotheses is that I think a particularly promising type of relationship is likely to be well-off men, especially in tech circles, just because that happens to be the types of friends and followers that Default and I have, who maybe lean in a kind of edgy direction. They're maybe they're culturally conservative and fo- not particularly edgy, but just slightly edgy relative to mainstream kind of liberal educated culture. And these are men who have a very hard time dating because, you know, you go on a date through Tinder or even one of the one of the fancier and serious matchmaking apps and you sit down for that first date with with a woman in a metropolitan area like you know the san francisco bay area or something like that and there's just all of these things that you're expected to say and think and believe as as a young man and you know there are just a lot of people out there smart good men who just don't really believe in the orthodoxies and so dating is this kind of impenetrable impossible minefield of, of political orthodoxies and, and self-respecting, strong, intelligent men, you know, should not really submit to that. And they don't want to submit to that. So they're not dating as much as they could be. And they're not finding matches as, as well as they could be. On the other hand, there's another population, which is what I think of as uh, hot, smart, charming young women who are outside of metropolitan areas maybe their economic prospects are not particularly promising for many structural reasons in in the American economy that have nothing to do with their own abilities or potential. And they're outside of, you know, elite social networks. They don't have uh, cultural capital necessarily in, in these types of networks, but they're pretty, they're smart. They're, they're more than smart enough. They're maybe they're not geniuses. Maybe they're not going to be like founders or something like that. But, you know, I think uh, a lot of men in tech, they don't want to marry uh, Mackenzie Bezos, who is going to divorce them, uh, you know, many years later and take half of their money. They want someone who's hot, basically smart, but not too smart that they're a threat and uh, who are generally kind of submissive and and actually want to submit to a more powerful, wealthier man and get the benefits of that. And 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 I think those women have very, very few kind of cultural uh, avenues for finding this type of mate. So. My that's just one of my hypotheses. I think this is going to be a one type of pairing that could go off very well for our agency. Okay, so so I, when I, uh, I described this, I had the 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 genders swapped. So the the idea that you're talking about is the man the man from the city, the woman from the country, uh, who would never meet in current America, and and connecting them somehow and and trying to make a match. Okay, so so let's talk about that. But but just uh, you you uh, we'll put a pin in it for now because you mentioned um, uh, forcing these people to get married. And, right. um, so how, how does one do that? Uh, a contract, um, a blood oath, uh, what's, what's the right. mechanism? So obviously we can't technically force them because we live in a free society where you're not allowed to force other people to do things. However, we can do many different things that significantly increase the soft, supportive social pressure. And that's of course what arranged marriage is. In, in ancient time, you know, in, 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 in pre-modern societies and in many and in some countries even today uh, have always functioned in this way. You, you, you're not actually forcing. You're just applying constructive, loving pressure, basically. And so okay. whereas whereas, uh, you know, the traditional arranged marriage, which still takes place in places like India, whereas that uses family pressure to 
find good matches and then to support and encourage those matches. What we are going to do is use a combination of data and a combination of social social network pressure, essentially, in a way to uh, kind of create these create these matches. And the other the other factors are very strong self-selection pressures, which I think are very favorable to us. In other words, we're calling it arranged marriages, right? We're saying we're going to force you to marry someone more or less. So think about the type of person who opts into that. We believe, I believe that there is a type of person out there who realizes that actually marriage is not really about this. It's not that complex of an optimization problem. You don't need the perfect person. You just need someone who's basically solid and who like data suggests and other sensible people around you suggests would be a good match for you. So we're, I'm expecting that the people who opt into something as crazy as a literal arranged marriage agency in, in a Western country are going to be people who are highly predisposed to accepting the suggestion and the pressure. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start our, our, our methodology starts with a data based uh, algorithm. So I run the stats basically, and I look and I do some initial filtering on the, on the larger pool of applicants. And then when we have what we think are some uh, probabilistically likely good matches uh, default uh, who's a very you know nice, uh, smart, charming, and friendly young woman is going to swoop in and do a series of qualitative interviews to really get to know people and really really use all of her you know uh, feminine uh, knowledge and insights to 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 sense out qualitatively and subjectively who feels to be like a genuinely viable match. So we think this combination of kind of analytical uh, Apollo. Uh, statistical analysis with the with the uh, qualitative feminine uh, Dionysian uh -huh. element is, is gonna is gonna be the trick to our success. So that's how I would summarize the the secret sauce. Okay, uh, so it's all interesting. I mean, I I guess I I'm uh, naturally skeptical, but you know, there's these uh, there was a Netflix show that premiered roughly around the time when the pandemic started where like people were sort of in pods and they were like, you know, in a mansion or something, but they didn't see each other. They were just like communicating and love at first sight or something, some bullshit like that. And like, I, I didn't watch it, but people loved it. And probably for the craziness, I, I assume, but it seemed like maybe there were some real connections as they say in, you know, reality TV dating shows uh, happening there. So there's people who are eager for this. I agree. And maybe in the Silicon Valley milieu, there's more people who are, sort of like, well, I'll trust the data um, to find me, you know, find me a match out there. Um, and, okay, do you, um, do you anticipate, you know, sort of a, I assume in old school matchmaking, you know, there, there would be an, an some, you know, the, the old, you know, the old wizened woman or whatever in the Indian village is like, there's, there's bringing them together to sort of sus, suss each other out. And probably the parents are close by at this time, but there could be like just no chemistry or something or the person is much less attractive than they claim to be, or or something like that, and then it's all called off. How do you how do you just make like that sort of introductory period uh, between the people happening <laughs> practically? Yeah. So I think at the end of the day, ultimately, if people in our marriage process just don't want to marry, then that's going to be their prerogative for sure. And so that's the final decision is ultimately going to be up to them. But what what I think is that because from the beginning, this is branded as an arranged marriage agency, and you have strong pressures of self-selection. You also have pressures of kind of network selection Selection in that, you know, the types of people who follow me and the types of people who follow default are a certain type of person probably who are probably going to be statistically more disposed to this sort of thing than, than perhaps the average. Um, so we think that, the, that these pressures are going to get us a lot of the way there, but um, – at the end of the day, they're, they're going to have the op opportunity to, to, to opt out. So what, what I think this is going to do is there's, we're going to create a series of kind of escalated costs and investments, basically. So people, you know, there's this idea of sunk costs and people debate whether or not sunk costs is a fallacy or not. But the basic idea is that, you know, the more you invest in a process, the harder it is to walk away from that process. Mm -hmm. And you can debate whether that's a bias or whether that's actually rational, but it, it, we know for sure that it does seem to be a a, 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 a psychological mechanism that most of us uh, are affected by. Oh, for sure. So and and we, that, yeah, well, you know, like you uh, you pay to see the movie at the movie theater, you know, when the world returns and, you know, you're 45 minutes in and it sucks. But you're like, I might as well stay because I paid already and see see what happens. So a absolutely. So what we're what we're thinking is that 
you have these people opting in to be forced to marry, and then they're going to be going through a lot of work with us. They're going to be putting in a lot of time, and at a certain point, they're going to be putting in a large sum of money. That's something also I, I should introduce to the to the concept here. It's not going to be cheap. It's going to be very, very expensive uh, at the at the end. So we're going to spend a ton of time and effort making the matches, talking with people, and we're not going to be asking for money for you know to, up until the very end. So it's a, it's a very authentic, genuine kind of searching process uh, that we're going to invest a lot of effort into. But when we think that there is a genuine match that really makes sense, and we believe these people can be happy together, we are going to we have to work out the details because it's, it's it's a very experimental thing. Still, we're still kind of working it out. But we believe that at that point, if we are confident and they have invested all of that effort into what is essentially defined as a, as as a kind of forced marriage situation, we think there's actually a very high probability that, especially after they cough up a very large sum of money to meet their match. Um, sure, if they if they cough up, you know, $10,000 or $50,000 to meet their match, and then they don't like their quote unquote chemistry, and they want to not marry the person, fine, that's on them. But frankly, I think chemistry is kind of bullshit when it comes to marriage. You know, mar like, when people get older, they lose chemistry. That's just kind of a fact of the matter, right? Like people get ugly. Marriage is about much bigger and more important things. So frankly, what I'm trying to do is create structures where think bullshit things like, chemistry which is really just a meme from youth culture um it falls to the it falls to the background because of the high investment uh that, that's being put into what is a much larger type of, of decision okay so uh in a traditional matchmaking setup or a tr it could be traditional like 200 years ago or uh you know in some you know american uh, indian community uh, indian american southeast asian communities there's, there's still matchmaking going on i think there was another netflix show about Indian matchmaking in either the U.S. or, or England or something, uh, I assume there's like sort of a flat fee, and then if there's a successful match, you pay more or something like that? Is that, is that the usual economics of this of this system? Yeah, we're thinking about it. Um, I, I, I don't, I'm not terribly, I mean, yeah, I've, I've, I've obviously done some research on all of this, but uh, I'm not terribly well-informed on all of the different uh, models that, that you can find. From my perspective, we are going to basically cross this uh, one bridge at a time. We're at the moment just collecting initial applications. We have something like 800 people who want this so far, or at least claim to want this. Of course, some of them won't, and that's fine. But uh, I think with 800, we should, with 800 applicants, we should be able to arrange at least one marriage within a year. I would think it's very plausible. Okay, um, and and, so, and and if yeah. you were anticipating, you know, 10 to 50 thousand dollar payment, then you don't need um, all 800 to to hit or something like that. Okay, so let's um talk a little bit more about sort of the cultural aspects of this that are interesting and. Um, you know, I didn't intend to bring this up, but I had a, you know, a, a mildly viral tweet uh, two weeks ago where I was joking about um, how the pandemic was going to mean that no um, big city, um, powerful uh, ed editor women were going to be able to go back to their hometowns and fall in love with a hometown hunk because there's no, not going to be enough Christmas travel these, this year. So that was, you know, making fun of the Hallmark, uh, you know, the various sort of Hallmark comedies. And that's a very common trope in that is the 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 powerful woman from the city goes and encounters the, you know, homespun guy from the country who is maybe like a uh, baker or something, or he, right. and he has a dog and so on and so forth. And, um, and so maybe that's why I was thinking initially that that would be the gender breakdown, but you're describing a different gender breakdown. And maybe in my corner of Twitter, the discourse is more about the, uh, you know, the uh, men are trash and the fuck boys of the city versus these like highly talented women who, uh, you know, have Ivy League degrees and powerful jobs and they can't seem to find a guy who will stick around this, this kind of stuff. So but you're you're viewing it through the opposite end of things. And uh, maybe uh, you're thinking more in terms of like traditional gender norms uh, than the, the sort of men are trash people are, so are thinking. About. I love I love what you're saying. And I, I, I there's some probability that what you're saying could turn out to be a good relationship persona in our in our data set I, and i would love to see that this is all hypo these are all hypotheses so um frankly i mean i don't need to be right in my initial hunches about what types of relationships will emerge we're gonna we're gonna do this through data driven way uh starting quantitatively and then going to qualitative data i would love for you to be right my skepticism for towards your expectation is that i mean i hope to be proven wrong but my sense is that uh high paid successful career women are not going to be people who find this service most attractive um i think i, I think highly successful well-paid career single career women 
are in a very exceptional and peculiar niche that we've never really seen in, for most of human history. And I, to be perfectly frank, I, I'm, I do wonder sometimes if they've actually kind of carved out for themselves a, a peculiar evolutionary niche, which so badly maps on to traditional marriage expectations that for a lot of these women, marriage might just not ever be a sensible or rational decision. Um, I don't know. We'll see. I, I hope that's not true, but there is definitely a kind of careerist, well-paid single woman who basically can't find any men who she considers to be good enough for her uh, just because statistically there are going to be very, very few men who are uh, kind of more accomplished than her. And the other problem being that of those men who feel like a good fit to her, who feel worth marrying to her, not only is that a small set statistically, and that makes it difficult, but a lot of those men for really basic, I think, evolutionary reasons have a hard time really uh, investing themselves as a spouse into a woman who is so successful because of the risks and challenges that that poses to their own uh, individual interests. So, I mean, I don't have I don't have a big um, talking point on that. But my, my sense is, in other words, uh, a, a, an empowered, highly successful and well-paid single woman is going to see an arranged marriage as beneath her and is not going to be interested in what we're doing. I, I could be wrong, but I think there might be a kind of culturally conservative cohort within kind of successful, accomplished, well-paid single women. Um, and that could definitely be. But I think the average high paid, successful single woman living in a big city um, see, would see the idea of Justin Murphy telling her to, who to marry as just un, un, intolerably offensive, like unthinkably un, unthinkable. So that's, yeah, that's my sense of that. Yeah, that I, I would, <laughs> that would be my bet also. And so I guess I, I might as well, uh, you know, say a little bit about myself here. So I, I'm also a millennial. And I also got married, I guess, at a relatively young age for a millennial. So I'm 37. I got married when I was 29, I think. And then I got divorced at a relatively young age uh, for a millennial. And I got divorced a year and a half ago. And so I was in uh, the relationship I had actually starting college. So it was a, a, a usually long relationship for uh, people of our age co cohort. And so I never interacted with dating apps um, before because I missed that period entirely. And so I was a, you know, as of a year and a half ago, I was a newcomer to this world and, you know, um, viewing it as a late arriver, basically. And and now I live in um, the greater New York City area. And um, I mean, the things that I've noticed that women seem to be looking for as they present themselves in the app, you know, it's 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 varied. And uh, but the most the, the most consistent themes I found are um, one, no Trump supporters. And that makes sense for uh you know, uh, liberal New York city and two, um, um, uh, height restriction. Um, and so you have to be, uh, very uh, listing a woman, listing your own, t own height. If she's, you know, five, nine or over and has says has to be like taller than that or two inches taller than that or something, or just listing have to be at least five ten or something. And that really did surprise me. And it's, um, you know, there's way more stuff about you need to be a certain height than anything about, having a job, having a salary, uh, you know, wanting to have kids, uh, wanting to, um, you know, uh, being bald, being fat, like, you know, you can imagine like no fatties or something being a sort of common thing. Maybe there, maybe men are saying no fatties in their profiles, but it's really like height is, height is the only thing. And, and that is, I don't know, there's, there's something very, you know, uh, basic about that because you can change your, how fat you are and you can change how much hair you have, but you really can't change how tall you are. Um, and so that, uh, rules out a certain cl class, but that so that surprised me, and that is, you know, maybe pointing towards a sort of um, more evolutionary psychology or traditional understanding of, of gender pairing than um, most people would suspect or something. I mean, you know, so there's not it's not like every every woman cares about this, but it really is. Um, uh, it was striking to me as a average sized <laughs> in height man uh, how many women were looking for five eleven or over or whatever. Um, so, yeah, so, so I, uh, basically some of these, <laughs> no Trump supporters, Trump is going away. Uh, I, I assume in two years people will not be putting Trump at all in their uh, in their dating profiles. And, but I think the height, the height stuff does point towards 
something that that is, totally. is underneath the surface. I, w- I wouldn't even be so sure about Trump going away in dating terms. People are going to be asking, "Did you vote for Trump?" That's true. It's going to be a litmus test for years to come. Yeah, I, I can see that, and it's definitely you know if you are a um, Trump supporter in the millennial dating pool in the Greater New York City area, like you are a rare bird, and uh, I you know and if you're looking for a at least among women, I assume there's somewhat more men, but um, but it's not um, right. not very common. But there's a lot of secret Trump supporters, though, in in metropolitan areas. More, I think more likely to be men, and uh, you know, there's a lot of hot, smart, very charming women around the country who don't live in posh cities and don't have posh careers, who uh, don't really care about politics. Like marriage really shouldn't matter. Uh, politics really shouldn't matter for marriage, and historically, you know. People can get along just fine and have very happy marriages with one person being liberal, one person being conservative. It's only very recently that uh, everything has become so polarized and all of these other kind of social variables are now correlated with political partisanship. But that's very, very recent. And it's and it's frankly pathological. Like um, this is one of the reasons why I believe there is this the the dating market is failing to clear, in other words, because of these kind of weird inefficiencies, um, which are which are clearly suboptimal. And that's why I think a forcing function like an arranged marriage agency can basically just use brute force to overcome these uh, kind of cultural inefficiencies that are blocking uh, the marriage market from clearing. And I think that's a really, really good example of one. Like it's just a stupid idea. It's a false and it's a false and dumb idea that uh, millennials and Zoomers have in their mind today that their spouse needs to have the same politics as them. They really don't. And uh, we're going to disabuse them of that uh, of feeling and expectation. Well, yeah, I, I mean, it's definitely I, like studies have been done on this of like um, like mixed political marriages, and there's fewer than there were um, 30 or 50 years ago, and 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 sort of the like big sort type stuff of you know uh, there used to be you know yeah. Northern Republicans and Southern Democrats and stuff, and so it didn't all line up. Whereas now, if you say I'm a Trump voter, that kind of specifies a certain lifestyle. At least if you're maybe so there's people who voted for Trump and other people who are like Trump voters who are like proud of being Trump voters. And, and that's those are two different things as well. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, when I um when I am on the uh, when I was on the dating apps and was seeing, um you know, uh, someone with a MAGA hat, you know, that's uh, get out of here. That's a swipe away. Uh, not for me. Um, but but maybe I'm uh, <laughs> maybe I'm in this, you know, decadent elite uh, <laughs> left wing uh a culture that uh that well you know i think a lot, your i think a lot of i think a lot of people are you know finding themselves nowadays they're like you know 35 maybe even older they've never been married before because they spent all of their 20s and 30s shopping for the perfect person who has the right height and the right hair color and the right political team and you know i think they're starting to realize oh yeah maybe actually i'm being a little too picky on stuff that doesn't matter and uh maybe i would rather marry a good-natured vague Trump supporter, <laughs> then die alone. And uh, I think that's like a really important calculation that a lot of that is going on in a lot of people's minds, but they're too scared to say it. They're too scared to talk about it. And one of the benefits of a, an arranged marriage agency is it kind of gets you off the hook for that kind of ethical culpability you imagine yourself to have. Right. So I think it's a frankly pathological and ridiculous notion that, you know, you have to choose your you have to choose who you fall in love with. You have to choose who you devote your life to in, in partnership uh, because you feel like, oh, if they if if they voted for Trump because they hate, you know, the the current politics of the Democratic Party, that you're somehow committing some kind of immoral or unethical activity uh, to 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 possibly fall in love with this man. Let's let's say, uh, it's just so that's that's so dumb, basically. But people feel bad. People feel like they they would be doing something ethically wrong to marry someone who. Yeah, is, is, has some vague support for for Donald Trump, or but even if they you go know, through an arranged, if or, they go through an arranged marriage agency, then they can be like, "Oh, it's not my fault. I didn't choose to marry a Trump supporter. <laughs> Justin did it." Okay. So, well, yeah, there's even this this kind of uh, genre of article that is like, "I fucked a guy, and then I found out he voted for Trump. Like, what do I do now?" Um, uh, as if like you know he revealed that he was a child molester or something. Um, right. So y- y- this is a modern dilemma. Okay, so the, the it's called. So we'll include the link on blogging as below, arrangedmarriage.co. Is that what it is? It's arrangedmarriages.co. Co. Okay, marriages, plural, dot co. Okay, so but I want to, uh, in the time we have remaining, I want to uh, switch to talking a little bit about you and your background and uh, coming from this podcast. So 
uh, like I said, this podcast chat for God uh, currently in either hiatus or, 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 or maybe it may come back. It may not, but um, yeah, in the original, pause, let's say in the original incarnation, it was you and um, an interesting woman named Ashley, uh, who was previously the co-host of a show called uh, girl chat, which came out about three years ago. And it was a very interesting show and kind of a bizarre sort of crazy performance art thing. I don't even know how to understand it. That show ended. Um, and uh, Ashley had a number of changes in her life and uh and so in this in the new iteration so the chat for god was in some way a sequel to girls chat um but more focused on religion and especially ashley's unusual personal life and in the begin but in the beginning of the of the of every episode you say something like uh hi my name is justin i used to be an academic but i quit because it was satanic um okay so can you can you talk a little bit about that and becoming academic and then leaving. And what, what does that, what does that mean that it was satanic? Yeah. Well, I don't think academia is more satanic than other big bureaucratic institutions. I just think all big bureaucratic institutions are essentially satanic because at the core of big bureaucratic institutions is a fundamental compromise with the truth uh, because to scale a large organization and make this kind of functioning machinery, all of the individuals in that machinery have to, uh, basically submit to a certain reign of you know, sort of symbolic consensus that uh, never really maps very well onto reality. But to speak about reality is always therefore a kind of existential threat to the to the to the morale of of the firm, if you will. Mm-hmm. And that's how I see the the essential kind of fundamental bargain with the devil there. And uh, you need that bargain with the devil to be able to scale up an or, a large organization uh, with a lot of people in a, in a big bureaucratic institution. And yeah, it's it's like all bargains with the devil. It goes back to Faust. You know, you can get a lot of by by making an agreement with the devil, you can gain a lot of power and leverage and accomplish amazing, desirable, attractive things. But you're making a bargain with the devil and the devil's going to get his share in the end. And <laughs> I think that's what we're basically seeing with the increasing degeneracy of uh, the intellectual life that takes place within academia. There are still many very brilliant academics, many of whom actually participate on on various blocking heads shows. <laughs> right. So there are definitely uh, geniuses and super cool, interesting, smart people who I to this day very much admire who are professors. But they are uh, by far the, the tiny minority and the, the overall uh, kind of drift of the intellectual life that takes place within the walls of university campuses today is just in, obviously to me, I think it's pretty obvious. It's just increasingly satanic. I mean, it just feels, smells, sounds, and uh, looks satanic in every possible way. Okay. So you, you went to, so you're a political scientist. Yeah, that's right. And so you went to grad school, you became a professor. Now, did you not get tenure and then decided just to leave academia entirely, or did you decide no, before, no, I got before that? So okay, here's, okay, so you, okay, you, you had tenure left. That's very that's very unusual. Yeah, that's right. So with the caveat being that it was the British version of tenure, which is not quite the same. So okay. I'll, I'll give you the story real quick. No, I did very well. I mean, I did everything right, and I, I was very successful. I was actually, a, you know, not to toot my own horn or anything, but I, I'd say it's fair to say I was a rising star in in my department. Uh, I, I did my PhD in the U.S. and went over to England. Um, and so the American PhD training is just way longer and more, way more sophisticated. And, and the American PhD culture is much more ambitious and, and, and energetic. So you ha- as an American PhD student going over to England, you kind of have a natural unfair advantage in hmm. many ways. Um, so it's not too hard to kind of rise to be the cream of the crop in the UK academic system. No disrespect to British PhD students, but it's just a different culture and they don't have as much time to, to, to develop their, their work. So yeah, I went over, I did very well. I was, you know, I, I checked all the boxes, had good student reviews, um, was, a, was a positive force on campus, got along well with everyone in my department. And to this day, I love everyone in my department. All the people that I actually worked with were awesome. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I, I had very prestigious publications coming out uh, at, the, at, at the time. So I had, I had fully arrived and I had just been made what they call permanent. That's, that's the British version of tenure, meaning like, I, you know, I could have easily had that job for life pretty much guaranteed as long as I, you know, didn't like step out of line. Uh, <laughs> and um, I thought that the, the boundaries for what would be considered stepping out of line were, were quite wider than I, 
I thought they were quite wide. It turns out they're not as wide as I thought. You know, I really believed, I really deeply believed in this mental model a lot of us have kind of from the movies that academia is this game where you pay your dues and you, you know, you fall in line, you shut your mouth, you work hard. But then once you get tenure, once you have those prestigious publications, once you have that permanent uh, tenured position, then you you really do have the freedom to think and say whatever you want. And I, it, I was sorely, I guess I was naive. I, in retrospect, I was probably naive to take that very seriously and to believe in that because as soon as I got made permanent, the British version of tenure, I literally started saying whatever I wanted. And it, I, it was very clear, like very quickly that that wasn't going to be allowed. I was doing, I mean, it wasn't even anything particularly bad. It wasn't like politically bad. It was more just like, you know, inappropriate. Like um, I had a sabbatical one time, um, my first ever sabbatical, got the semester to just do, focus on research. And one of the things we did during that sabbatical is my wife and I went to Amsterdam uh, for a little holiday for a weekend. And uh, we, we ate magic mushrooms. We ate, took psychedelics. And I was like making videos of myself tripping. And I was like putting them on Instagram because I, I was just having fun. I wasn't mm -hmm. like saying anything bad. I wasn't doing anything bad. I was just saying, hey, folks, I'm on I'm on mushrooms right now. I'm, I'm on drugs. And I was just like saying saying interesting things. And it was it was a lovely time. It was a beautiful time. And uh, I got in trouble. That was like the beginning. That was the first time when I got reprimanded informally. And uh, that was kind of the beginning of the end because it was kind of like I, I, I just felt from there that it was like not going to turn out well in the long run because the whole reason I got into academia to get this supposedly very secure gig was so that I could have the freedom to actually just be genuine. And it was clear – it, it became very clear that that wasn't really uh, going to be allowed. Hmm. So that's interesting. I mean, um, I'm not familiar with the British system at all. Do you think it's in America where there's stronger free speech norms and maybe it's more like, uh, and, and maybe tenure is stronger or something, it, what you would have been able to get away with uh, posting your trip on, on Instagram and they would have just been like, oh, that's just Justin being Justin or, or, or... – it's a good question. I'm not sure. My I, my take on this is that I think the selection pressures are stronger in the U.S. So you're less likely to get in America a tenured professor who even does LSD or mushrooms or let alone wants to post about it on the Internet. Right. So so, yeah, by the time because it's just harder, it's way more competitive to become a tenured professor in the U.S. It's, it's harder. It's more competitive. There's more brilliant people gunning for those spots. So the only ones who make it are the ones who have most fully and radically submitted their entire soul to the system. So they're not going to, they're, they're just not going to want to take any chances. Okay. That, that, yeah, that, that makes sense. So when you, uh, so the podcast chat for God, obviously it's a lot about religion. Um, you're Catholic. Uh, uh, that's right. And, and, yeah. and Ashley is Catholic as well. And so I'm Jewish and don't know a ton about Catholicism. So it's been interesting listening to the podcast and, and, you know, learning things and seeing different perspectives. But so when you're saying that, uh, that academia is, is satanic and that it even smells satanic. Uh, is that a, a metaphor? Or is that literal? I take it pretty literally. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I mean it pretty straightforwardly just in the sense that when you tell little fibs for the sake of allowing a large bureaucratic organization to function, those fibs multiply and they spread. And it's like once you allow a few fibs into your worldview, it's pretty impossible to keep them from 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 spreading and 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 kind of eating up everything. And before you know it, your entire culture is just going to be nonsensical and in uh, kind of demonic and and confused and and weird. Like when you walk in, like I think as humans we have pretty we have pretty strong kind of built-in ethical faculties. And when you walk into a situation and you just can kind of feel the things aren't right. Um, you, we have an ability to do this. And I think academia is one of those. And one of the ways you're seeing this is that if you've, if you've been in the system all your life, then of course it just seems perfectly fine because you're a fish in water and, and fish don't even know they're in water. Mm -hmm. But what's happening with social media today is the public is starting to see like what professors talk about, what they actually teach, what they actually think. And that's why you're having this massive populist backlash against academia and, and universities as such. I mean, it's massive. Like it's, it's truly, truly massive. Um, and so it's like the world right now is basically divided between those who have an investment in academia. And those people are, of course, incentivized to say, oh, it's perfectly fine. This is good. Nothing, nothing to see here because they've made this bargain with the devil. And uh, people who, are, who don't have a foot in the door look at this and they're like, this is obviously demonic. <laughs> um, and so I've kind of had, my, I've, I've kind of been in both. Uh -huh. uh, I've had my foot in and my foot and, and my feet out. But, um, 
yeah, I, I, I see it pretty literally as as satanic. I mean, satanic is not necessarily this thing that a lot of people think when they think satanic, they think of, you know, people doing like weird rituals in the forest. Well, under, I, like, I think of light. the I think of the red guy with the hooves and the tri tricorn poker thing that like that's my image from popular culture of right satanic. but that's not, yeah exactly that's what most people think exactly right but that's but that's not it at all the a, a much more realistic mental image of, of of satanism is just a bunch of people in a room telling fibs to each other and speaking statements that literally don't even make sense to the people speaking them and they're just doing that in turns and 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 acting like they're happy and like they're making progress. Mm -hmm. I mean that that's that's a picture of what Satanism really is, I think. And uh, in a way, it's more terrifying than you know some kind of you know seance in the forest, <laughs> right? Which probably doesn't happen all that often. Um, you know, and, and and well, the you know the people who are having a seance in the forest, I, I don't know if they're actually uh, really doing anything. I, I would doubt it. But um, okay, so I mean, one of the uh, and we have a kind of uh, uh, we need to wrap this up pretty soon. But one of the yeah, we should. one of the maybe last questions. So it, like I said, uh, chat for God, check it out. It's it's interesting. Um, and uh, one of the contrasts in it seemed to me from in the podcast was uh, Ashley was raised in a very Catholic family, um, of like a Slavic uh, Eastern. You know, like uh, I, you can clarify exactly what it is. Sort of uh, you know sect of. Catholicism, and then you were ma raised more in a t more towards the secular end of Catholicism, um, and then in some ways you are sort of like you're like presenting your different ideas about what um, you know the teachings of the church and the teachings of Jesus, and um, and but I, it's it's interesting because it just yeah I mean the the podcast is unique and dynamic, and you have um, her. A very unusual life. You're somewhat more normie life, and you talk a lot about like normies and and uh, and you know the weirdo online freaks. But then you like you obviously like stepped away from the normie path of like staying in academia. That would be what the normal person does. Um, where I where am I going with this? I mean, it, it, how do you like uh, conceptualize your your belief? Because in some parts of the podcast, it would be like you would say something, and then um, like Ashley, who sort of knows like is more enmeshed in the because of her upbringing in like the tenets of Catholicism, she would like correct you or challenge you on something. And it sounds like you are, you're sort you're still like sort of learning within this world. If I'm um, understanding that correctly. So do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. Sure. I mean, that's, that's basically right. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I'm a Christian. I, I'm, I'm Catholic, and, but I'm not like a very good one or educated one. I mean, I don't understand half of it. Half of it is totally idiotic to me. I just don't, I don't get it at all. I mean, I, I'm a social scientist, right? I'm a, I'm a, I'm an educated, modern, rationalistic person. And, uh, you know, I don't attest to empirical claims about the world that don't stand up to the scrutiny of what we today know to be the, the canons and the protocols of, of, of scientific judgment. I do think that scientific judgment is essentially scientific method. Scientific judgment is essentially the, the final arbiter on on what we can say about the empirical world. And, and that's that. However, it's also just very clear to me that scientific method only has traction on a fairly limited set of questions that we have to answer as humans on how to live. I think that we have to basically make decisions about certain questions that are simply just structurally not amenable to scientific method. And so what do you do with those questions? Well, you can't use scientific method. So what you have to do is essentially look around, think as honestly as possible, and then essentially take a leap. And that leap is what is faith. That, that's what faith is. Mm -hmm. And and so, um, you know, I look around me and I, I look at different books I've read and I just try to take a holistic picture of what seems true in, in, in my heart of hearts, what just combining my knowledge and science and my feelings and observations. Uh, and it looks to me like Christianity is true. I believe that it's true. In other words, I have faith that it's true. But what exactly it involves or what exactly it means, heck if I know. I mean, this is one of the biggest mistakes I think people make when they think about Christianity. It's like people think that to be a Christian, you need to be able to affirm and explain like 20 different crazy like statements like the, like Jesus like uh, was buried and then rose from the tomb. And like I don't I don't I've never heard of anyone like rising from rising from a tomb. Uh, and as far as I know about how the empirical world works. I have I don't have any reason to believe it's possible for anyone to ever die and then rise 
from a tomb. But at this sort of thing, I just say, I don't know. I don't know. It's it's a mystery, right? I'm But I'm willing to say, I'm willing to have faith that it's true. Mm-hmm. Why not? Because why not? I mean, that, that's basically what it comes down to. Like, um, I don't understand it at all. It doesn't make sense to me at all. I, I'm not going to convince anyone. I don't want to convince anyone. I don't need to. I don't care. Um, you can say, it, I believe that Christianity is true from the looks of it holistically. And then also just be totally honest about certain certain uh, facets being utterly incomprehensible to you. And, and that's and that's what I say. Um, I, I, I will have faith that, it, that these things are true. But – and this will be my final statement is ultimately if I don't understand how that could be true – I see that as a shortcoming and limitation of myself. Mm-hmm. So I don't understand how it could be possible that Jesus rose from the tomb. But I'm a limited creature. What the heck do I know? I mean, I just don't know. And and I I I, I will, I'm happy to take that burden on myself and say, this is a mystery to me. I'm going to try to keep figuring it out. Maybe there's something in there. Maybe there's a way of understanding that that is just smarter than I am currently. And if I believe in Christianity, then my job and my goal and my interest is to figure that out, to figure out that body of work and to make sense of it in a way that uh, is is true to me, that I can articulate in my own language. But, you know, we're, we're, we're very fallen creatures today. We're all even even Christians are, um, you know, uh, we're, we're, most of us don't have very deep or strong kind of like roots reading the Bible from an early age and this kind of thing like people used to do. And so, you know, I think trying to pretend that oh yeah I know everything about Christianity and I I'm happy to strong I'm happy to strongly affirm every statement that the that like you can you can throw at me you no you just if you try to do that you just sound like an idiot you just sound dumb right and uh, I, I I think I'd rather have like an authentic honest live and weird Christianity than this kind of you know heavy fake gravitas where I'm like trying to do mental gymnastics to defend some statement that literally makes no sense to me. Okay, that that's very interesting. I could ask you more, but we probably should wrap up now because you have yeah, to go. I should go. I got something right now. So thank you very much for having me, though, Arya. Well, th- this was very th- interesting. Thank you for coming on. So you're so people who want to follow you, uh, arrange marriages. Co. And what is your Twitter your Twitter handle if people want to check you out on Twitter? It's just Jay Murphy, but with no you. Okay, and then that'll, that's will be linked below. So okay, thank you, Justin. Uh, thank, thank you, you. Jill, thank, thank you, to our viewers and listeners. We'll see you again next time. Later.